Dave here, how are you? Today is the 29th of December 2019. Next show will be in the new year 2020. Amazing, isn't it? I can remember the changeover to this millennium when it was 1999 and all the spooky stuff that was going on about that. Anyway, enough's enough. Uh, I trust you've had a good week. Uh, didn't get the show out last week because we had some things happen, you know, the death of the dog and also the internet was down. The internet is still down. If there's anyone out there that can help me get this thing fixed, I've got a phone line, just no internet. They're working on the NBN in the street. So if you know someone in Telstra that can push a magic button for me, that would be fantastic. Not asking for special favors, no. Just if we can hurry things up a little, that would be lovely. All right, so today on the show, I'm gonna talk about this display board that I built. This is not going to be the video on how I did it. It's going to be the show. We're going to have a look at just the workings of this board. And also we're going to have a look at the workings of the number seven, six, five and a half, five, four and a half, four, and the 220 plane. Now you'll notice up here, I have a 220, but it's a Falcon. It's not a Turner. It, it's identical, except it has a different knob on the end. Now that, um, what do, what do they call it? A cellulose acetate knob, the raspberry colored thing. That's the thing that's going to set it aside. I, that's an old one that I found on Gumtree and didn't cost a lot, but I needed it to be able to create this board. Now, Ian Kerry also helped me by bringing his Turner 220 into his workshop and he had it wrapped up like a baby and <laughs> it didn't have the blade or anything, just the body and the knob on the end. And it took me all my strength to prize it out of his hand. <laughs> don't drop it, don't drop it, he's like. Anyway, thank you very much for that, Ian. All right, so as I said, we're gonna have a look at this. Um, I have already got all of the people that purchased the uh, spindle sander, the jet benchtop spindle sander. That competition is closed now. I can't pick a winner yet because I can't get on the internet to run Rafflecopter. The Rafflecopter thing is the thing that does the draw for me. I'm not involved with it at all. I just push the button and say, pick a winner. And that's what's going to happen. And the lucky winner, and I wanted to announce it for Christmas, but I couldn't because we didn't have the show last week. Also, I don't have the internet if you're not aware. So oh, it's an interesting thing. I'm pre-recording this show and I'm going to load the whole show. I'm going to save it onto my mobile cell phone and then we're going to drive down to Penrith this afternoon it's actually Friday the 27th but shh, don't tell anyone and Vicky, are, Vicky and I are going to Penrith and we will upload the show whilst we're driving the camera will be plugged in sorry the phone will be plugged into the power in the in the car and we will get reception there because there's no mobile phone reception here in this property I'm in a valley Analog used to be able to get down into the valley and find me digital straight stream. There you go. All right. I've talked enough, I'm guessing, and I'm hoping everyone had a good week and you're not too hung over from too much Christmas cheer. Let's go over to this board and I'm going to show you a couple of things about it. So I'm going to switch cameras back again and you can have a look. There we go. I'll come over to the side and I will point as I move things. Now this is the number seven, six, five and a half, five, four and a half, four, and the 220, the little guy. Now something that's really nice about what I've done here is let's go for the five and a half. I'll take it out. You notice there's nothing holding it up there. What I've done is I've recessed rare earth magnets, a 19 mil at the top and a 10 mil at the bottom. And just here, you may not see it, because of the light here at the moment, but that is 5.5. And I've done that with a three millimeter end mill in the CNC machine. And then I poured resin into it. And then I dug it out again because it was too deep. And then I coated it again. But that's, there's a whole lot of stories in there. Also you'll notice up here is a little indent that I created in the CNC for the blade. If the blade should be protruding, when I put it back and to put it back on the board, it's a very easy matter of drop it into the base first and then up here. Now, these 
uh, six millimeter deep recesses that I made for the feet or the sole of the plane to fit in, I've made the recess about two millimeters longer at the top here to allow for any expansion or contraction in the board behind. Uh, what else? What else? What else? I've also screwed it top and bottom to the wall into studs and also along the center. You'll have a look. You'll be able to see there's another screw just here. That is just in case this board decides to cup. And if it cupped, of course, these don't bend with the wood. The wood would have bent and then it would have released the plane body from the magnets because the magnets top and bottom. And if it cupped that much, this would fall on the floor and that would be a tragedy. Um, this I did with the CNC as well. I went down and saw Ian. Let me just pull this camera back a little bit so maybe you can see me in there with it. There we go. It's a bit easier. Uh, you won't see the color as much now that I've pulled the camera back because the lighting is going to play different mucking around with you. You notice all these lights that I did the last show? This is one of the reasons why. I want all this illuminated. When I'm working at the bench right here at, the, at Arthur's old workbench, I see all this beautifully, all of these raspberry handles show up magically. You know, they're just these things. Let me see if I can get it back here. You may or may not see it like that. If I bring it up close, you will see that's what I see working at the bench. And it's a pleasure. It's an absolute joy. I'll pop it back in there. And I probably wandered off onto another topic. Now I was talking about this. Ian brought in a box of chainsaw blade that was Turner, had the Turner insignia on it. And I photocopied that. Oh, sorry, photo, photographed it with my phone on the box, took it into Photoshop, deep etched it, and then transferred it from Photoshop into Illustrator and turned that deep etch, etched path into a vector, imported that vector into Aspire and then I could do whatever I want with it. I could turn it into tool paths. Now Aspire also has the capacity of creating a vector from an image, but it's not as sharp. See, this is an old cardboard box and it was furry around the edges, around the text. And I was having a bit of a time trying to get it really clean. Deep etching is just a way of going around with a, a, tracing a line around the image in Photoshop and then converting it into a path little marching ants. Anyway, you may not be interested in that. So that's how I did that. And also this was just with the VCarve, sorry, with, with a VBIT using VCarve in Aspire. So Rene Turner, the guy, this is the guy over here. He is the guy who started this business up. And I was introduced to all of this through Ian Kerry. You've cost me some dollars here. I bought these. Remember I bought these prior to having the hernia operation to give me a project to stop me going crazy for six weeks whilst I wasn't allowed to pick up anything more than eight kilos. So this was my saving grace. This kept me sane and I loved it. And now I have something that's on display and all of these work beautifully. And I'm going to show you that in a second um, and just how, how nice they work. Um, what else can I tell you about it? Are oh, the... Uh, Let's go to the six. All right, now down here, I'm gonna bring the camera in closer so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's see if I can get it in real close. Okay, that might work. So here's the six. Now the thing is with the six, it's got this piece in the middle. And so I had to take this down with the CNC down and leave two millimeters of timber in the back at the back of the board. So this is 18 mil thick. This is six mil recessed in. So that leaves me 12 millimeters. So I took this down nine millimeters, I think it was, uh, from this point, which left this sitting in there. Otherwise, this would have just gone ping across the room. I would have lost it. Filled it with resin, turned the whole board upside down and then created a large slot right the way across the back of the board to expose the resin from the other side. Then I painted that with clear resin. It's, as I say, I get obsessive about these things, but it's so much fun. And don't they look beautiful? 
you can see the raspberry color coming up now. I'm going to turn that around even more. See that? That's what I see when I'm using the planes. All right, I'm going to bring this camera back over here and aim it down at the bench. There we go. All right, now today you will probably also see that I'm wearing thongs, which uh, a lot of people around the world will say, what are thongs, David? These things, it's been warm. I'm not using any power tools today. I'm doing stuff at the workbench with some hand planes. I think I'm going to be pretty safe. Your call, if you want to do this kind of stuff, you know, if you want to wear shoes, wear them. Uh, but it's warm. I'm not, I think Ron Polk sometimes wears uh, thongs around his workshop as well. I've seen it, I've seen it. <laughs> okay, now what I've got in here is a chunk of Australian cedar. Now I've got that in there because it's nice and deep and it's about an inch wide and I'm going to create a really nice flat square edge without using a machine, without using any smoke and mirrors. It's, I'm going to show you the easy, easy way to do it. Now I'm going to use the jointer, which is the number six. So I'll grab that off the wall. How, no, the number seven, I should say. What am I talking about? There you go. This is the number seven, and it is exactly the same length as Arthur's trying plane. Let me grab, grab that for you. This is the wooden trying plane. See that? Steel jointer, wooden trying plane. Now these were not a jointer, but you could use them for jointing. You know, this like this and the number six, you can use both for jointing. Uh, it's the same width. Well, actually it's a little bit wider, but the blade is the same width in both these. Do you enjoy this kind of stuff? I, I love it. There is so much history here and it all works. It's brilliant. The jointer, the wooden jointer is probably another four inches longer than that. All depends on which particular company was making them as to what they called them back in the old days. The, uh, my jack plane, the wooden jack plane, is halfway between the five and a half and the sixth. Not the sixth, not the sixth. Uh, the sixth, the, s <laughs> the number six. It's, it's kind of, the five and a half is the, the do-all of uh, the steel planes jack plane. So the jack plane is jack of all trades, hence that's why they call it jack. All right, let's have a look at this. Now, I'm going to switch over to that camera over there because it might be a little bit easier. I want to have a look at what it, what it looks like first. Um, I'm going to bring it in closer and down a little bit, I think. What I'm doing is I'm looking in the other From over there, I'm looking. So I'm just making sure I can see what's going to happen. All right, that's not too bad. I'll, I'll switch the cameras over now. There you can see the thongs. There we go. All right, here's my piece of cedar. Here is the joint up. Now, at the moment, the blade is only just poking, only just poking through. So I normally leave the blade up so it's not doing anything. Come on, up you come. There we go. That's not doing anything. Now, there's two ways of getting a blade working nicely. I don't know if you can see in there. Maybe even, you know what? I think I'm going to bring this around to here. And that's going to... That might work really nicely. Yes, that'll work well. All right, so down in the... In the uh, mouth of the plane. This is the frog assembly basically which has got the blade, the backing iron and the lever cap and this is the uh, angle adjustment lever at the back here and underneath here this brass piece which you can see there is the depth adjustment wheel and that's the one we're going to use at the moment. So I could either sight down the plane, look down there and don't run your fingers down over there because the blade will cut you. You can run backwards, but not that way. I could sight down the plane, which is what I normally do. But another way of doing it is just slowly bring the blade up until it starts to cut. 
This has got to be done on a straight piece of timber though. There we go, it's just starting now. See that? Okay. That's in the vise nice and tight. Now, you can work the right side and see I've got a bit of a cut there and the left side and I'm getting a bit of a cut there. So I'm, it's pretty even as to how it is. I can adjust it left and right. As I say, if I'm cutting too much on one side, I push the, lever, the, the um, blade adjustment lever towards where it's pulling out more timber. And that will bring the blade this way because it's pivoting in the center there. This is, when I move this, it's gonna, this is a whole lot of leverage happening from here. There's the pivot point and just below it is where it actually moves the blade left or right. Okay, now to make it really easy to get a really nice parallel or square cut to the board. So we've got, got the board here. I want this to be as square as possible. I use this guy. Now this is a fence. This is a 90 degree fence from Veritas. And even it will even work on Stanleys and Turners. That's how you put it on. It's not rocket science. So there you go. That's what it looks like when it's on. There's a couple of rare earth magnets here that hold it on. It's got a step sideways before it comes up. And that's so it comes in over the blade, just there. Otherwise, if it was just straight up and down the back there, you see this space here beside the blade, it wouldn't be doing anything. I'll make sure that I've got everything in the picture there. So it's covering the blade. Now, I can, by pushing my hand against that more, see how I've got a rock? It means that's not square. So now I can expose a little bit more of the blade and pushing against there and down on the front, not on the knob. You can see that it's starting to straighten it up. I'd like to get the camera down even lower than that. And I will. You've seen it do a little curly there. I think I can bring it so that it's looking along. And that might be a little bit more interesting to see as it goes past. Yep. All right. So here we have the fence. And the way I'm holding it is I'm pushing against the fence and down here. I'm not grabbing hold of that. So I'm pushing down. And also I've got my finger down the side of the frog. Can you see that? So three fingers around the handle, the tote, and one, my forefinger there. Here we go. Okay. A little bit left there. We'll fix that. Aren't they beautiful? I love this stuff. All right, so now that was an even shaving right the way through. I can also do that with the number six. Get in the way of the camera for a second while I get the number six off the wall. Same thing. I can always try and back the blade up. I never did on the seven just then, did I? Putting it away. So it's not cutting anything. And then I'm going to slowly wind the wheel clockwise from me. Wind it clockwise until I feel a little bit of resistance. That means it's starting to touch the blade. Starting to, to push it down. Ooh, we're getting very close. Oh, very, very nice. Now I'm getting a good shaving on the right hand side and nothing on the left. So that means I got I got a shaving on this side, but nothing here, which means I need to push the, the blade adjustment lever towards the right hand side, towards where the curly was coming out. Now I've got a shaving there and I'm moving, transferring it across 
as I'm going. So I need to pull it back ever so slightly. Okay, it's on the right and the left and back to the right again. Yep, that's good. Do you see that? Is it, these are little things that you're going to say, why didn't I think of that? This will also go on the number six. It'll even go on my number four. It's brilliant. Here we go. So we're going to do it with this. This is just in case you don't have a number seven. Let me keep on going like that. Okay. That's the shaving. We'll go again. Of course, remember we were adjusting the plane down here, so it wasn't picking up a proper shaving just then. Let's go again. There we go. That is beautiful. <laughs> it's not hard, isn't it? Just magic. There we go. All right. So that's the number six. So it's a, it can be used as a jointer as well. Um, then we're going to go to the number five and a half, which is the jack, jack plane. Again, I'm going to back the blade down. So that five and a half and that jack had the same purpose. Now, there is also a number five, which is a jack. There's five and the five and a half. You notice the one here in my right hand is narrower than the one in my left hand. This is for people that aren't very strong. And this is for Superman. Because <laughs> you're taking another, you know, third almost of the amount of timber off with this blade in comparison to the other one is the narrower blade. Let me throw this on. Again, see this right angle fence or fence, joint fence, whatever you want to call it from Veritas works with all of them. Veritas aren't paying me to do this. They didn't give this to me. I bought this just sharing info. Now, again, we haven't got anything happening there. Adjusting it as I'm going along slowly to see if we're waiting for the shaving to come up. There we go. I've got something there and I'm going to go across. And yes, I've got shaving on the other side too. All right. Beautiful. Here we go again, the full length. Aren't they great? So that's the five and a half. And I'll pop him back up there. Uh, the five, it's going to be the same thing. I don't really think you need to worry about seeing that. We'll pop that up there as well. And then the smallest of all the planes, and I'm going to switch over to the other camera because you're probably sick of seeing all of that. And transition. There we go. Let me see how much time we've done. Uh, we have been recorded for 23 minutes. It's only going to be a short show today, maybe, maybe half an hour. The number four... And this is the one that I've restored. This was an absolute mess. And there was a lot of work had to go into these ones. Um, there was the back here wasn't sitting because this stuff shrinks. The uh, bolt or screw or nut, the brass nut didn't fit in there anymore. It was caught. I had to drive it out with a um, with a, a timber dowel from the other side. It took a lot of shoving and finally got there. The same on the on the handle at the front, sorry, the knob at the front. All the bodies I painted with um, satin black paint. Polished all these. The frogs I painted with gloss black, which I think I showed everyone before. Beautiful little plane. This, again, it's narrow in comparison to the four and a half. See them side by side. This is the little four, this is the four and a half, which means it's the same width as the seven, the six and the five and a half, the jointers. Now this stays true for, um, for the Turners. Now remember, Turner stopped production in 1970. These are all antique planes. And it runs true also for Stanley's. Now this is my father's cousin's plane. Now, neither my father or my father's cousin are with us anymore, but uh, my father's cousin's son, 
who would be my second cousin, I'm guessing, gave this to me and I did a bit of a tidy up. Now you notice also the depth adjustment wheel is not brass on this particular one. Now this is made in England, but my jointer, sorry, my, um, my little smoother that I had since I was 16, which is also made in England, Bailey, uh, has a brass wheel, and I, this one really needs to clean up. Uh, one of the interesting things I found though, there's only two slots. So three ribs and two slots on that brass wheel on, the, all, the, on all the Stanleys, but on the Turners that you can count them. Three slots and four ribs. Little different things, just little different things. So Turner was shut down in 1970 on his 62nd birthday. All the little things that you find out as you're going along. This is a number six Stanley as well, that, but it has a brass. But again, three ribs, two slots. I don't know if there's any reason why that's there. Why has it got a yellow handle and yellow on the sole? This plane was given to me by a subscriber. And he said, Dave, this was given to me as an apprentice. I'd like you to have it because you obviously enjoy what you're doing, which I do. And he said, uh, it's all yours, but please, please, please don't take these colors off. Now, I think he worked in a government department as an apprentice, and there were other apprentices in the same wood shop. And they had all their own tools color coded. And so he had to paint those on. So it's a bit of history. I love it. All right, what's the next thing? That's right, the 220. And you'll notice up there, if, if I get the camera up close, let me see if I can do that. Bring this around here and aim it up. That might work. It might work, I don't know. We'll find out in a second. I'll have a look at what the other camera is doing. Um, a little bit higher. Yeah, you should be able to see that. It's not going to stand out very well. But you'll see I've got 220 also done in red resin. Um, four, four and a half, 4.5. And this, you know, I love it. You're not going to see the colors bounce like I can at the moment because, as I said before, it's all working for the lighting. When I'm standing here working at the bench, all of this is just beautiful. All right, the 220, what am I going to do with that? I'm going to sharpen it because, as I said, someone gave it to me and I think I need to get it tidy. I throw these back up in the... How easy is that? This, there's no mucking around with... Um, well, look, I could have put it in slots, like had slots, bang, bang, bang. But at an angle, it would have come out over here and created a shadow. And I see at the moment, all of these planes and, and this area that I'm working at are all really well lit. And that's why one of the other reasons we put all this light up here, I didn't want to create a shadow underneath. I could have put a light fitting under the box, I guess. But where do you stop? And where do you stop paying for electricity? You know, I know with the solar, I don't have to worry about it so much. But even so, you know, there's some responsibility has got to be apportioned to what we're doing on this planet. Now, let me see. Maybe, maybe, maybe this camera. You notice I'm down the other end of the workshop doing this at the moment as well. Maybe if I was to raise this camera up a little bit. Now, I've never sharpened a 220. I've sharpened block planes before, but never a 220. So this could be a very short, <laughs> very short segment if I can get this camera to work. Let me see. That might be it. That might be it. Uh, other one? Yes. Let's have a look at that. All right. Again, with the stones, I think about there will be good. I've got the coarse, extra coarse and the fine. Leave that one out. Extra coarse is that way up. I think it'll need a quick touch with the extra coarse. This is just a matter of undo that little lever and that pops back. This comes out. There is nothing else to the blade. That's it. It's a very simple blade. There's some slots in the back that this little uh, guy here hooks into. Notice the handle, wood and falcon. It's got a nice blade. 
That's pretty cool. A bit of the magic water, the trick that I learned from Jim Davy. And let's see if we can give this a bit of a new life. Just gone 30 minutes. Getting close. That's not bad. Again, we're working the front. We're not having to work all the way up to the back of the blade. It's a plain blade. It's not, it's not a pairing chisel. Nearly there, spin it around, a bit more water. I think that's going to do us, and I'm going to work this end. I'm not doing a figure eight at the moment because this thing is sliding around a lot. Let's see if I can do it now. There we go. been warm it's been warm we got to 45 degrees here the other day and the um, fires have been all over the place I'm not getting all the way down there this might need a bit, bit of work on the machine but we're getting very close that'll do me with that grade flip her over Now we're on course. What's your preferred? Leave comments. What's your preferred sharpening method? Do you like using diamond stones? Do you like using oil stones or water stones or totally machines? Tormic style slow speed grinders or the Pro Edge like I'm a fan of or some other kind of machine? or there might be some other way of doing them. I think Jim uses ceramic stones now. That's starting to get sharp. I'm pretty sure he uses ceramic. Now, why do I keep referring back to Jim? Well, he's, he's kind of the Australian guru as far as sharpening is concerned in, in Australia, obviously. David, you idiot. <laughs> I've come up with a new game, a new card game. Well, it's not a new card game. It's a card game that I've kind of made up. I'll go to this other camera for a minute. If I can, you'll be able to see what I'm doing. If I bring it back a little bit further here. So this card game I call Impatience. I've got to make sure I'm talking to this camera. I spoke to the other one for a second. Impatience. Now, it's very much like Patience. But I took forever and, you know, I, if, if patience was hardly ever coming out for me and I was getting, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> I like something to come out. If I start something, I want to finish it, you know, and I don't like packing up the cards before they've all been turned over. So I came up with this thing called impatience. And basically, you deal the cards out, same as patience, but the, instead of doing first card turned over and then six more face down, the last one you turn over as well. So you've got a card up, face up either end and the middle five are face down. Then you start from the left and you do exactly the same. You're left with three face down in the middle and then you're left with one face down and then you put a face up on top of that. So you'll notice when you go through three at a time with your, you know, turn the cards over three at a time uh, to expose what's happening, you'll notice that it works perfectly as well. You'll still end up with the last three turned over and no residual cards left in your hand. And it's amazing 
how much easier it is to get that game out. Impatience, I love it. Now there's a couple of rules as well. And one of the rules is you must play the best advantage. So to me that means, this is something Vicky showed me. What you do is if there are, say, um, a 10 with no card underneath it on the dot down below. So there's no card with its face down underneath it. And there's a jack with its face up. So I might have a red jack face up and a 10, black 10 face up. You're not allowed to move that 10 onto the jack. The reason being, you may have another black jack, well black 10 I should say, in your hand as you're turning them over. So it's more important to get the cards out of your hand than to, to just throw something and have six spaces instead of seven. Um, sorry, seven, six cards showing instead of seven. It's just, you, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So you do this. Now the other thing is, if there is a card with a face down, bear with me, it's easy. <laughs> There's a card with a face down and it's a card on top of it. So I've got a black four on top of the card with its face down. And as I'm going along, a red five exposes itself. Like we're not <laughs> like that, but you know what I mean? Like you turn a card over, you've got a red five and it's sitting on top of some other cards there. Well, if there's still a card under the black four, red five, that's right, you must move it onto there to be able to expose the card that's underneath, turn it face up. Now there's a lot happening during this game as they're going along and it gets faster and faster and what have you. And if you don't turn, if you don't put that card on the other card, if you don't put that black four on the red five, you must say to yourself, dickhead. <laughs> it's one of the rules. It makes it interesting. It doesn't sound like much at the moment. Or if you don't want to say that, the other terminology that's accepted by the rule maker, which is me, is you idiot. Now if people are around you and watching, they're also allowed to chime in. But if they make a wrong call and they say, you idiot, or the other word, and you don't want to expose the card, or so, sorry, the card's not sitting over the top one that's being face down, that's playing to advantage, well then, you are then allowed to call them, you idiot. Okay. Now this could be an interesting game for a couple of drinks around Christmas. Probably not a good one for husband and wife to play together or for, for husband to be watching while his wife's playing or vice versa or your partner. I've got, I've got to get out of this 1950s. I'm child of the 50s, so I've got to get out of that mentality that, you know, we, people get married. People live with each other and that's fine, whatever they want to do. So I've, I'm just saying that because I don't want to be seen to be someone who's a bigot. All right, so we're still sharpening this. So what do you think about my game of impatience? I think it's fun. It's fun. I play it all the time now because I get it out. As Vicky says, it's almost impossible not to win. <laughs> so, that'd be the same. It's almost as impossible to lose, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, she'll be having a little giggle now looking at that. If we get this show loaded, it's 40 minutes. We're nearly done. Oh, this is coming up nicely. As I say, I might need to touch, touch it up on the machine just a little bit more. Flip her over. This might seem a little repetitive from some of the shows that I've done, but give me a break. I'm, I'm getting back on the horse. Uh, I've, got, I've got that stuffed toy that John Lafferty and uh, um, all, all the people helped jump in and, and get it made. There's a, a replica of Barry. If you weren't aware, um, the Lafferty's got in touch with my wife and she <laughs> put the dog on the dining room table, took photos from all around it and everything. And then they sent that off to Plush Puppies, I think it was, somewhere on the web. And a replica of my dog was made. Well, now the dog's dead. Buried him, planted a tree on him the other day, a nice big um, lipstick maple. It'll get to around 13 meters tall and a, and a 10 meter spread on it. So, uh, you know, they offered to cremate the dog or um, have it disposed of. And I said, no, no, I'm taking him home. 
all the other pugs that we've had are buried on the property here as well. So we wanted to do that. And thank you again so much to everyone who's sent their well wishes, condolences, you know, um, chin ups, all that kind of stuff. Thank you so much. It meant a lot to me. The first day that I did it and the next day, it was really, really hard. There was a lot of grief. But after that, I, I was good. You know, it went from grief to relief, I tell people. And uh, it's, I think it's for the best. You know, it was very sad when it happened. And I know I'm probably going to get idiots uh, making comment if, during this premiere on the side. They're going to try and give me a hard time, but I'm, I'm pretty resilient, guys, you know. Uh, it is what it was. It's not a child. It wasn't one of my kids, but it's close. It's very close to it. All right. I think we're... Oh, yeah, that's getting very, very sharp. Now, I'm gonna, last thing I'm going to do is I did last time. I'm going to put it on the, um, the strop from FlexCut and put some um, rouge on it. Now, you can use MDF instead of leather if you want to. Sorry, looked at the wrong camera. If you want to, you can use MDF and do this. But I think the leather is just going to... You're taking it to a polish. I think the leather does a slightly better job. Now, I can go backwards and forwards at this stage while I've got the, the, bevel, the bevel up. Now, we looked at that other camera again. And, oh, that's beautiful. But this side, I always drag back. Rest it against the, the leg. Not against, not against where the hernia was. It's still, um, it's getting better. It's amazing how many people say to me, pull me up in the store and say, Dave, How's that hernia going? You know, is it is it good? Is it still still repaired? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I should have done it. I should have done it all those years ago. But life was busy. I know there's a lot of people out there probably in the same situation. Life is busy, and they've got one of those rotten things. And I've got to show you. Hey, isn't that beautiful? And the back's coming up beautifully as well. Just a little bit in the corner there that's coming off. Okay. The back doesn't have any rouge on it. You can put rouge on it if you want. And rouge is basically their fine polish. I love it, I love it, I love it. Look, you might think, Dave, it's getting lame. You sharpen planes, you sharpen chisels, and you're still smiling. Well, it's so therapeutic. Now, this blade does not have a backing iron, like all of the bench planes up there, the smoother, all the way through to the jointer. They, don't ha they, all, they all have backing irons, but this guy doesn't. I'm very excited to see how this one goes. Now, as I said, you've got all those little slots in the back, and they line up with this little guy here, and it's bevel up. You can't put it bevel down because what'll happen is the, the heel of where I've just sharpened. So the top side of the blade, this part here, would actually, because it's down low, as it's in the plane, it would ride on there. It wouldn't ride on the blade. The blade wouldn't be going through. So that's why it's got to be bevel up, which means the flat side of the plane blade down. We'll pop it in there. That's looking pretty good. And this one in there. Whoop, I don't think you can see that. Uh, let's swap cameras again. You might want to see that going in. Uh, transition. Okay, I'll take all of that out again. So we have, and I'm going to drop the camera down. We've only got a few minutes left in the show. I want to do this so that you can all see what's going on. And you're getting a good look at my hair. It's I can't believe you guys might think, oh no, your hair's falling out, Dave. Well, it's not. 
it's getting better all the time um, and it's not wishful thinking <laughs> okay there we go we've got this there's a little rib on here this wheel here has got a thread going one direction so that's a left hand thread and in the bottom it's a right hand thread so as it does this as you turn it it pulls it up so that's that's pushing it down clockwise counterclockwise pulls it back out of the mouth so we're going to pop that in there as I say counterclockwise pulls it back clockwise pushes it down I'm going to push it down just a little bit. This has got a little lever here, and that's just working a cam. Okay. Got to be to the left-hand side when you put it in, and then adjust the blade so I don't, you're not going to be able to see that properly. But anyway, believe me, that's where it's got to be. And then locked. I can adjust it by that screw. See this screw here? I can tighten that up after the fact, but I don't want it too tight whilst I'm lowering it down. So clockwise was forcing it down, I think. Yes, ever so slightly coming out now. There we go. Now it's leaning across a little bit. I'm going to try and push the back of the blade over because there's no lateral adjustment on this. So you have to actually push it by hand. I've gone too far. I'm going to try and pull it back. There. I'm, that's exposed pretty well. So on the one side and on the other, you may or may not be able to see it. Now, I'm going to take it over to the timber where I was before, and now I'm going to have to raise this up unless there's some magical way. I think this will be fine. Bear with me. All right. There we go. Tip that up ever so slightly. All right. Block plane on. And I'm going to turn this counterclockwise to pull the blade back out until I can't feel it offering any resistance. Okay, so that's moving easily now. Ooh, a little whisker came up. I'm going to turn it clockwise after it gets a grip. So you turn it until you feel the resistance, just a little bit. Look at that. How nice is that? Let's give it one run right away long. Look at that. But this isn't what it's designed for. This is for shooting the ends a little bit and also for chamfering. See? That's what it's designed for. Those little curly things. All right, I think that might be it. And let me switch to the other camera again. Back to the main one. It may have been a little bit of a boring show, but yeah, I got, a, I got a couple of minutes to get back in the saddle, as I was saying earlier. Maybe a couple of shows will do it for me and then we'll get back into, you know, interesting stuff. All right. Let me see. There was no competitions this week because we didn't have a show last week. I will start having a hunt around and see if I can... There's a couple of things from Carbotech that I want to try and see if I can twist their arm because it's a little, the dollar value is a little bit, bit more than the $100, which was our original agreement. Um, I'll, I'll have a chat to them, see if I can get it up a little bit uh, because there's a couple of things there that I've basically done the $100 range in the store for things that I think you guys might be interested in. But there's a few things there that are around the $150 to $200 mark. So I'll have a chat to them, see what we can do. And of course, George is looking after us as well with the IMFs every time. And they've sent to New Zealand, which is fantastic. Um, if I'm not responding on YouTube much at the moment, it's because I don't have the internet connection. During the premiere, I may not even be able to join in with you because I'll have 
um, mobile phone. I don't know if I'll be able to respond. I'm, I've, I'd have to be out, go for a drive in the car, park under a tree somewhere and join in that way. I don't know. We'll see what can happen. I might be able to tether my phone to my laptop and join in that way. So it could be fun. Or as my wife says, could be peaches, could be lunch break. Don't know. Anyway, there we go. That's it for the show this week. Thank you very much for dropping by. If you like what I'm doing, please give me a thumbs up. Let people know what, what's happening. It's very relaxed and laid back. Um, there's no pressure. I try, and, I try and do things to accommodate everyone. Uh, this project here, even though it's for hand tools, is full on a CNC project. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. You can do it with an ordinary router if you want to. It's not a problem. I'll probably discuss that when I do the video on it. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Um, it'll be down in this corner down here, I think, where I'm hanging around. And there'll be a couple of pictures come up on the screen as well as links to other videos that I've done. So look after yourselves. Be nice to each other. And let me see if I can get this intro and text happening here. There it is. See you next week. Look after yourselves, especially New Year's Eve. Don't be doing anything stupid. See you next week. Bye.